Belle Island, Newfoundland. In the middle of Conception Bay, a quiet place, a place for tourists to experience the rugged beauty of the rock. But 67 years ago, Belle Island was a very different place. The world was at war, and this sleepy little island was of prime importance to the Allies. A fact you'd never know about until you slip beneath the waves of Conception Bay. That's where you'll see what's left of the Battle of Belle Island, a battle that was all related to iron ore. In 1942, Belle Island had one of the richest iron ore mines in the world, and during a world war, iron ore was turned into steel, steel that made tanks, ships, weapons to fight Hitler. On the morning of September 5, 1942, 16-year-old Patrick Mansfield was looking for some work, helping to load ore on one of the many ships in the harbour. Just another fine morning it was, a nice, nice sunny day. We went to the pier, that's where you used to get hired on that. And uh, we got hired on to go down aboard this ship uh, trimming coal in the third hatch. Patrick's job that day, on board a ship called the Evelyn B, he would work in the hold making sure the coal was evenly distributed. But Patrick wasn't the only person interested in that bay full of ships. The German Navy had their eye on it as well. Skipper Bill Flaherty is a local historian. So they were well aware of the strategic value of that island and that ore. It was considered as one of the most important targets during that time by Admiral Donitz. Admiral Karl Donitz, commander of the German U-boat fleet, dispatched U-513 to patrol the waters off Newfoundland. She went looking for iron ore boats near Belle Island. So U-513 came in, in cover of darkness, and also underneath another vessel. It was late night, it stayed on the bottom, and waited until the first opportunity presented itself for an attack early in the morning of the 5th of September. An attack they did. But the crew was inexperienced. They forgot to arm the torpedoes, so they sank harmlessly to the bottom. The crew also forgot to compensate for the sudden loss of weight, so the U-boat popped to the surface. It broke the surface, but even at that, nobody noticed it. So it immediately went back down to its uh, attack depth, fired two, tor two more torpedoes, and successfully sunk the uh, steamship Saganaga. Deep in the hold of a neighboring ship, Patrick Mansfield felt the vibrations of an enormous explosion. The ship shook what we were on, so we ran up on the deck, and when we got up, we see a ship going to the bottom. Mansfield arrived on the deck just in time to see the Saganaga sinking, but U-513 wasn't finished her attack yet. The U-boat, after the first uh, attack, made some maneuvers to position itself to sink the Lord Strathcona. But remember, this crew was inexperienced. As they turned to fire, the U-boat crashed into the Lord Strathcona, badly damaging the U-boat. The captain decided it was time to retreat, but not without firing a parting shot. But on its way out, it successfully fired two torpedoes from its stern tubes or the rear of the U-boat and it sunk the Lord Strathcona. Do you remember seeing the explosion on the ship, on the second ship? Yeah. All you see is a big explosion, you know. Look, she was hit midship, you know. That would be right dead center, I would say, you know. Mansfield and his friends stood on the deck of their ship, too stunned to react. A U-boat running amuck in Conception Bay was beyond comprehension. But the stunned silence didn't last long. Conception Bay erupted in panic. Shore guns recently installed on the cliffs of Bell Island tried to come into action. They got permission, they armed their guns, they positioned themselves to fire, but there was no sight of the U-boat. The U-boat slid off into the mist. Eventually, she made her way successfully back to Germany. 29 sailors lost their lives on that day. Back on Bell Island, the residents began the grim task of burying the dead. 
A few bodies remain buried in one of Belle Island's cemeteries to this very day. Though many of the bodies were never recovered, the ships just went down too quickly. And some just couldn't be identified. The horror of war arrived in Newfoundland on September the 5th, 1942. And the war wasn't over yet. Gordon Hardy would find that out. He'd seen this bay before, 67 years before to be exact. I turned 18 then. You were 18 years old. I was 17 when I went on the Merchant Navy. Hardy was a young man working as a sailor on board a ship called the SS Rose Castle. She was anchored here to pick up iron ore on November the 2nd, 1942. On that same day, another of Hitler's U-boats was prowling around in Conception Bay. U-518 attacked at night. And on board the Rose Castle, Gordon Hardy had just turned in for the night. And sometime after midnight, an awful explosion and it shook the ship. And I knew it was a torpedo. Fumbling around in the dark, Hardy made his way to the deck. It was snowing. Hardy was only wearing his underwear. And I got up on the railing and I just jumped. Just as Hardy leapt over the rail, a torpedo, nearly 300 kilograms of explosives, slammed into the ship only a few meters from where he'd been standing. A cataclysmic explosion blew him into the water. And when she went down, she took me down with her. And I took in water before I got back up. These ships were fully loaded with iron ore. The uh, Rose Castle actually went down and like 30 to 90 seconds. They were, boom, straight down. The U-boat looked for a second target and quickly found it. Right after that, the next ship in line, and they were both in line, one behind the other. The uh, French, free French ship, the PLM-27, was sunk with only one torpedo. I could hear people all around me in the dark, caught screeching and hollering to God and the Virgin Mary. Memories of that night remain clearly etched in Gordon Hardy's mind. Memories that are rekindled when he visits with his family the memorial to the war dead on Belle Island. See Hardy, there's Charles Hardy, that's my first cousin. Like the one about how he met his cousin for the first time during the middle of the attack, swimming in the frigid water, he'd come across a life raft. He was too cold to pull himself up. He reached out his hand and pulled me in. And he said, I'm pleased to meet you, Gordon. He said, we're first cousins. And that's the first time I ever met him or ever heard tell of him. Patrick's cousin didn't make it. There's Ali, the fellow that died in bed alongside of me. Neither did his friend Sidi Ali both finally picked up by a boat and put together in a bunk. I suppose probably try to keep the two of us warm or try to survive him. And he rolled, they gave him something to drink and he rolled his eyes right over and they turned right inside out. When they did, I couldn't handle it anymore. Did you lose many friends on that night? She was 46 of a crew, and there was 11 came out of her that night. Yeah. You lost a lot of friends then? Yeah. Seventy men died in those two attacks, a battle little known outside the province of Newfoundland. But for these two men, Gordon Hardy and Patrick Mansfield, a battle that put them through a few hours of hell, a battle paid for with the lives of their friends. The site of a bloody World War II battle, Belle Island, Newfoundland, a place where 70 men lost their lives in two separate U-boat attacks. You'd think this ground would be sacred. But unfortunately, it's not. 
surprisingly not to our government, predictably not to every diver who visits the wrecks. Fortunately, it is sacred to these divers. Rick Stanley, a man on a mission, an underwater mission to protect the watery graves of the men who died during the battles of Bell Island. Why do they need protecting? Because though most divers treat the wrecks with the respect they deserve, some have been treating them more like souvenir shops than hallowed ground. At first, and years ago, that's the way it was. You know, like divers were treasure hunters, and they go and they get what they can, and you know that's fine. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of the history has gone missing now. Rick and his wife Debbie wanted to show W5 what was so special about this underwater memorial to the Battle of Bell Island, a cemetery unlike any you've ever seen. We start on Gordon Hardy's ship, the SS Rose Castle. What speaks most is the uh, is the loss of life. Uh, that was unfortunate, you know. They, that was wartime and everything. These guys were, they were, they, they, they shouldn't have been part of the war. As we approach the Rose Castle's radio room, it doesn't take much imagination to start wondering whether some terrified sailor sat here that night, frantically sending SOS signals, hoping for rescue. You know, these people were, were civilians for the most part. And, uh, and they got, uh, they got torpedoed, and uh, that's, that's a really important part of history, is that, uh, that those wrecks went down there with, uh, with those, uh, those sailors on board. For Rick, it's the small details that bring the wrecks back to life that remind him that there was a time when people stood on these encrusted decks. You know, you're swimming over them and you're seeing personal art uh, artifacts there. You're seeing torpedo holes, you know, you're seeing uh, bridges where people stood. Uh, you know, you're seeing the portholes that are, are opened, you know, that, that uh, you know, you really, uh, you really got a feel for, for what actually happened that day. Lovely to tell you, Mother. As we make our way over to the site of the second dive, Rick and Debbie talk about their work to prevent what amounts to grave robbing, irreplaceable artifacts taken. Even bullets from the boxes of ammunition that litter the wrecks have been pillaged. Yeah, those, those boxes of bullets are, you know, one, one box that was on top of the other box, of course, is the wood is all scattered around. And the, uh, now they're into the next box down below, you know. So. A lifeboat from the SS Saganaga sits on the floor of the bay. On the back, a brass plaque, the maker's plate, Harlan and Wolf, the same people who made the Titanic. One day we went to, uh, to take a guest uh, and show him the plaque, and there it was missing. And uh, so uh, that, that's like taking a piece of you, you know. Our second dive of the day, the SS Saganaga, the ship that Patrick Mansfield saw go down. A more somber tour this time, swimming through the hole punched in the hull by the torpedo, steel plating bent like so much tinfoil, an unimaginable nightmare for anyone in the vicinity of this attack. Well, uh, because of uh, the, the Saganaga and where she struck, where the torpedo struck her in midships, and uh, you see the crack in the hull, and you see the main ship's deck house is disintegrated. It just ain't there anymore. An anchor chain lays draped across the Saganaga. It winds its way along decks across open cargo holds to an anchor weighing several tons, laying by one of the railings in the center of the ship. A testimony to the force of the explosion, this anchor should be attached to the front of the ship. So you can imagine, it went up, things in this section of the ship ended up over here, the things in this section of the ship ended up over there. And, and you know, you, you, you visualize that and you feel that, you know, uh, you say, this, 
this is how that ship went down. A monument for future generations, a remembrance of the sacrifices made in war. That's what Rick Stanley wants. You know, these are war graves. It's a, it's a time capsule. So, you know, it's like taking something out of the time capsule. And uh, no, it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable for the people who lost their lives. And... and Rick just isn't the kind of guy to sit around and talk about things. So he set himself a goal to have this underwater site given some official protection. I believe this should be an underwater national historic site. So off Rick went to St. John's to try and find out what could be done. It took a few visits to sort it all out. Finally, the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Recreation told him these wrecks were already protected. They'd been listed as archaeological objects under the Historic Resources Act. Now the province says it's already protected. Do you believe him? Is it? You know, uh, I, I question it. I still see it. Uh, uh, things go missing. The thing is, there should be some kind of enforcement. So the Bell Island wrecks are protected, but the province admits the only enforcement is a kind of neighborhood watch. They hope people will report pillagers. Next stop, the federal government. Rick's been hounding them for years, but federally there's even less protection for the Bell Island wrecks. If you destroy it, if you remove it, it cannot be redone. It's gone forever. Robert Grenier, Canada's preeminent underwater archaeologist, a scientist who studied the most unique underwater sites in Canadian waters, who's worked with Jacques Cousteau. Even he says, we just don't have the laws in place. Not even laws to protect the dead if they're underwater. Edmund Fitzgerald, that's a watery grave. Families of the dead American sailors on board wanted to, to, to protect it through this, but that notion doesn't exist in Canada. Canada has passed the new Shipping Act that allows the minister to protect heritage sites, but they still haven't developed any regulations on when and how these sites can be protected. And while the bureaucrats dither... If we remove words in a book, suddenly you have no f sentences, you have no pages. Uh, as soon as you start to dismantle, the story disappears, the past disappears. And that's something that Rick Stanley is just not prepared to accept. He wants to see the Bell Island wrecks protected by a law with some teeth, a law that will fine or jail someone who pillages these war graves. He's doing a great service to his region, to his province and to the country. If nobody else is going to step in and protect these wrecks, well, as we said, Rick's not the kind of person to stand around and do nothing. He's putting his own signs up, warning people to touch nothing. These being an underwater museum, and for people to go into a museum that's on land and take a piece of them, those artifacts that are there, you know, that's totally unacceptable, and that's theft. And we were brought ashore somewhere around this area where I'm standing. There was a wharf here. And the thought that these wrecks might be protected offers some comfort to Gordon Hardy. He hopes someday Rick will be successful, that the final resting place of so many of his friends may be protected, even cherished, for many years to come.